And welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Bud Elliott. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson. Uh, We are so excited to be able to continue to uh, guide you through this long offseason. And we have something very special in store that came from the big old bag of mail. But this is not a mailbag episode, but it is an example of how you can join in in the conversation all through the offseason. We will have a mailbag episode uh, coming up before the end of the week. You go, you leave us a five-star review. In that review, you put a question for a future mailbag episode. We will add it. Uh, to the list and we will tackle it in a future episode. Now, this one was just too good. It was just, it was too big. It needed more time. We needed some uh, opportunities to think about it, to game these things out. It is college football playoff related, uh, especially looking back at the 2021 season. How close were we to a disaster in college football playoff? College football fans infuriated. We'll get to that uh, in just a little bit. But before we do, I do think it's an opportune time to be able to look at the college football playoff, uh, the timeline for expansion, and the formats that we are discussing and debating. Because um, in two weeks from today, as we sit here and record, we are going to have the college football playoff managers or the bosses or the, the people who leave their hats at the doors or vote without their conscience and recuse themselves. All the important people that will decide the future of the college football playoff, they're going to get back together on March 2nd. Uh, this week, we got a letter from American Athletic Conference Commissioner Mike Oresco that pinned to all of college football. I was happy to receive it. You know, I really it was felt a book, honored. not a letter. <laughs> I felt honored that I, I got. I was on the college football mailing list for uh, for Mike Oresco. That we had Jim Phillips shortly after talks broke down at the national championship game, discussing all of the ACC's opposition to this. Uh, to to me, there seemed like there's two. Big topics, uh, first that Phillips was pushing and then Oresco was pushing back on. Oresco, based on my read of things, wants to expand to the initial proposal of college football playoff expansion as it was proposed in July of last year. Uh, Jim Phillips is calling for a 365-day holistic review of college athletics, including college football playoff expansion. Uh, Danny, like... You, you mentioned it was a book, which means that you're part of the Reader's Club. You checked it out just like I did. You know, as, as a classic Northeast guy, he had to talk about the AL East and the Yankees and the Red Sox and try to, you know, pull examples from other sports. But but in these uh, arguments from Oresco, which do you think that you find yourself supporting the most? The only one I support is the overall um, overarching, we need expansion. Like, I agree with him on that he could not have picked a worse year to be making this case for a number of reasons. Like, cause he even referenced in the letter, like brand favorability, like the big brands get favorable treatment. Well, we just saw Cincinnati get in, you know, like, so you could use that before this year and use UCF as your prime example. Look, we beat Auburn in the bowl. Like we're just as good as everybody else. And we still got left out. Well, you actually had a seat at the table this year. And not only did you have a seat at the table, but, and I thought they represented themselves well. So I don't want to pick on Cincinnati because I thought they held themselves uh, with more than, than they earned their respect in that game. But we all watched it. Like they got bullied a little bit and the score was close, but it really didn't feel close. Um, So I disagree. Like, I think it's a bad timing. And then the other thing that I really take issue with is he said, we need to stop using the terms power five and group of five. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't agree with that because I do think there is delineation. And then, oh, by the way, his conference, which he might have had a better case before, three biggest brands in his conference and the three best football programs are all leaving it. So I just feel like a year ago, this letter would have made a little bit more sense. But this year, it just feels like he's just making the argument because we have this meeting coming up. I mean, all these commissioners are, are going to act in their own interest, right? Oresco's putting this out there because he wants to not see, you know, further exclusion from the P5 for his league, which is the best G5 league. And I agree with Danny that you do need to use that terminology because there's a big difference in, in the level of talent, in my opinion, on average. I mean, you have you have some outlier teams, but on average, there is. Jim Phillips is out here calling for the family meeting, right? Like, like hey, I, I know you guys think we need to do this, but we, we need to have a little family meeting here. We need to look at exactly how this house is run and let's let's cut through the bs there right the acc has a contract that's going to bury that league if it doesn't get ripped up at some point and uh, them voting for 12 basically 
all but guarantees Notre Dame will not join the ACC. So they're they're pushing for eight. And Greg Sankey uh, wants 12 because right now he, he can get half of the playoff revenue to his schools. And under an 18 playoff, there's no way the SEC would get four out of eight. Uh, but they could get, mm, I'm not going to go as far as say they could get six out of 12. Uh, but I think there's a chance they could in some years, you know, get four or five out of 12, potentially, especially as they expand to a 16-team uh, Super League. So everybody's just going to act in the in the interest that makes their, their schools the most money because that's literally what they're paid to do. They're paid by the presidents of those leagues to make the most money for those schools. So ACC and Big Ten seem to be behind eight. Oresco seems like eight is dead in the water. And if I was to just like you know, test the wind, I would say the eight doesn't have a lot of momentum, that it might be a chip, it might be a play. Yes, 100% but, chip. But we are talking about 12, and the fight to me seems about whether it's five plus one or six and six. Uh, what Michael Resco supports is the initial proposal, which is the six highest ranked conference champions get automatic bids to the 12-team college football playoff. Uh, the ACC and maybe the Big Ten might be in lockstep with this as well. They specifically want the five plus one where all of the Power Five conferences are going to be guaranteed with the one highest ranked group of five. You know, the we, we talked about the, the flatline six, no qualifiers, could be bad news for the ACC, could be bad news for the Big 12, could be bad news for the Pac-12, depending on what kind of season the American Athletic Conference champion, the Mountain West champion. Hey, I mean, look at the Sun Belt right now. Like the Sun Belt champion could end up bumping them out. I, I don't. I don't actually don't think that I have a, a a favorability one way or the other. But do you get a sense on the the fight around automatic qualifiers? Like which which way this thing might end up going, or what's actually important in that fight? I, I am not really convinced that the ACC and and the Big Ten genuinely want that. But I, I think they may just be throwing it up to stall this thing to get other things that they do want, right? Like, I, I've, I've run this scenario in my head. Increasingly, voters are becoming much better at incorporating strength of schedule. I, I believe that the chance that a, a second non-Power 5 team gets in over, like, a Big 12 champ or an ACC champ or especially a Big 10 champ is, is almost nil, right? Uh, unless you have, like, one of those crazy upsets or something, which is possible. Uh, but I think unlikely uh, in, in most years. I don't really get what – I don't think on its merits it makes a lot of sense, Chip. I think it's sort of a bargaining chip. Right? Actually, we want these guaranteed – we're saying chip a lot today. I, I think they're saying, hey, we want these guaranteed uh, bids as opposed to the just the top six conference champions. I think they're in either way. Is the guarantee for money? Like if we're talking about the units they get paid out for playoff teams, like Power Five wants to be like, hey, like we are the big draw. We are putting all the games on television in the biggest windows, and we therefore want to be able to guarantee a certain piece of this college football playoff pie. The best way to do it is to know that no matter what happens, our conference champion is going to be there. And if it is an upset, you know, if there is that um you know, the seven and five team that wins a bunch of tiebreakers uh, with the five and three conference record and they they pull off the upset against your best team in the conference, then you at least are going to have that team. But then more than likely, that other team's going to end up getting an at-large bid. So it's it, it seems like a little bit of insurance and a little bit of defense and, and perhaps an opportunity that even in the worst case scenario, you end up getting paid out double. So you think it's a protection of the upset winner making sure they get in. And the argument being that we are college football, power five conferences, sure. all of the hype for the college football playoff is built up on the product that we are putting in during the regular season. And for us to be disadvantaged in any way for this tournament um, is, is not fair considering the current status of the sport. Yeah. I mean, it could in theory devalue the conference championship games at the P five level. If the winner is not guaranteed to get in, especially if you have a scenario in which, Aren't they already upset? Aren't they already devalued if you have losers getting in? Oh, that's but you that's, already have losers getting in. That's what that's what I'm saying. Like, isn't oh. that's so I'm like I'm saying they like why does that matter? It doesn't matter now. It's I think it's the basic sell to a fan: the win and you're in. 
come to Levi Stadium, like a college football playoff, and you're selling tickets in September and October and November and December, and you're running the commercials. It's like the the day that a college football playoff contender will be named or will be crowned will be at our conference championship game. I think they love the addition that that brings to the pageantry. And I, I'm actually – pageantry because it's not like we've been going on for decades and decades and decades with conference championship games but the the hype around their conference championship games i think that's a big selling point agreed but to me it's never a true playoff until you say hey win this game and you're locked to go there if it's the counterpart is we'll lose and your season is over and i don't know how to do that without including the conference championship games in the playoff scenario which i actually wouldn't hate but then it eliminates the two teams from one conference argument. Yeah. Which I do think is necessary. Like I, like especially if you go to 12, like you can't justify saying, well, the sec only gets one or the big 10 only gets one. You just can't. So I don't know what the solution is on the way there, except for blowing the whole thing up in its entirety. But I did like the 12 team that they came up with of the 63 options that they were given by the consulting group, which is the true number. That was the number of different scenarios they were given. Billable hours, undefeated. Absolutely, right? That's we 60, could come up 63 with 63 options. Come on. <laughs> right. I'm not paying for we that. We could do it if you build for those hours. Um, I liked it. Like, I think it answered a lot of the questions that are out there for protecting the regular season. Like, because that's a big pushback for expansion. Well, the regular season won't matter. Well, and the conference championships won't matter. Like, those were protected by having, you know, a home field advantage potentially in a round one by having a buy. Um, by not having automatic qualifiers. Like a lot of these things were protected indirectly, I thought, in response to the criticism they've been getting. But the thing I've kind of resigned to is there's no perfect, or there mm. won't be a true playoff that we're going to see. I wish we could, but I just, I think we have to kind of go with the best of what we're given. What about the length of the season arguments? Um, because they're so I dumb. I I, well, all right, I'll roll my eyes at the like, it could be 17 games. And, and when you're trying to use that as the core of your argument, I, I don't have as much in that as much as I do. Some of these players who it started at media days last year were like, dude, I don't, I don't want to play any more games. It's so hard. My our bodies are beat up. Like by the, the teams that have been in the college football playoff, when the players who have been in those locker rooms are like, I, I can't imagine playing another game. With, that is what I give a little bit more credence to uh, necessarily than someone, somebody in a, 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 a nice suit who's telling me uh, about their the, the probabilities of someone making it from that first round all the way to the championship game. Do, do you think that there are adjustments to the game of football that are going to be tied to college football playoff expansion? So I'm not married to the idea of 12 regular season games. Like if that was really a hang up, but I don't think we're going backwards. Like I, I don't think there's too much money. But don't you feel like when we get this announcement and with the shifting landscape that we're seeing that the players are going to be getting paid and maybe it's playoff bonus money, maybe it's something, but they might just be directly employees. And then that argument kind of falls by the wayside. I think it's, I think that the, have you heard the, um, the side of this, which is like, well, you know, we could uh, keep the clock running on first down. You know, we could keep Love the it. clock running. And it's just make it NFL rules would absolutely it's basically the, imp the implementation of that leads us to less plays. And that is the it that takes so much coordination at the high level of, you know, the NCAA mm -hmm. rules committee versus, you know, the college football playoff expansion. But clearly there are a lot of the same people that are operating in all of these rooms. And that is one thing that I have sensed is that the workaround to health and safety is to change college football and limit the number of plays that are in a game. Because like you mentioned, Danny, we're not going back in the number of games for a regular season because that is so huge to the television contracts, but we can change the number of plays in a game. And in doing so, uh, I mean, there's going to be impact on uh, up-tempo offenses. There's going to be impact on the television viewing windows. I mean, it's, it's fan, it's player, it's coach. Uh, I have always gotten the idea that coaches are, would push back on it. And my guess is, and I want y'all, coaches just like reps, right? We just would like the opportunity to get as many reps as possible because 
we can't coach these guys all the time. There's our limits on how much we can see. And so anything that you're going to do to limit the number of plays limits, the number of tape, the number of experience, the number of reps that I get to see out of my team. But I think that the administrators will be wholly in support of this just because they can sell it on the health and safety angle. Can I play a clip from Keith Jackson on this? Sure. From 1983. So this is 40 years old. I dropped this in the group chat over Christmas. I, I, I found this old game. I'm not going to tell you guys what game because I, I, I want to do some more stuff with this. You're not going to get anything done on it until, one, we eliminate this nonsense uh, of arguing that it's going to cripple the academic circumstances. Because you know, and I know, <laughs> that's just a smokescreen. There's nothing to it. The Rose Bowl is probably the key to the whole thing. Because the Rose Bowl this year will, will pay more than $10 million. Next year, more than $11 million. Next year after that, $12 million. So is you he projecting the, the fights that are, that are coming? Like, no, he, they're arguing about the college football playoff at halftime of this game that he was uh, calling back when he worked for, for ABC. It was him, and I believe that's – I think that's Frank Royals. Almost has to be. I don't really know what Frank Royals looks like, but I, I know he and Royals were, were a long-time uh, combo back then. I mean, we've been arguing about the same damn stuff for, for 40 years now. <laughs> Keith Jackson just like, screw it. It's Christmas. I've probably had a couple. I mean, I, I don't know if he drank. I, I assume he did. It, it, you know, certainly if you're calling this game that I'm looking at you, and you're away from your family, you probably are having a couple. Uh, and he just let he just lets it fly, man. Like, it, look, as the players get paid more, and they will. Uh, I know we'll, we'll be discussing an article in, in the coming weeks that you know saying like, hey, you need to have at least ten million for your recruiting class now. Uh, you know, like, and that's that number is only going to go up. Uh, I think that the whole too many games argument is largely going to go away, but it, it wouldn't shock me if they if they try to limit some of the no huddle stuff. Well, but you, see, I would I would much rather because you can still go no huddle with you the can clock. still go no huddle, right? It's just yeah, I would the, much rather huh. as opposed to putting some sort of limitations on you know how many run number of plays you can run. Or, oh no, you won't have run, that. No, you can't do that. But I do think the NCAA who bad like you talk about a, an organization that could use an easy win i think if they stepped up to the plate and were like yep in the name of player safety because that's a win um we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna we're gonna uh, amend our clock rules and the way that you know it's a very simple we're gonna follow the nfl's rules and you know maybe we'll put in a two-minute warning and and i think for continuity's sake it makes it easier to make that transition for a lot of players i know for me it was like a difference like it's the game moves a lot faster in between plays but I think fans would actually like it because as much as we love college football, I still hear diehard college football fans say, do we really need a four and a half hour game? Like, so you could, if you could get the science of college football down the way the NFL has tight three hour and 15 minute windows, I think, I think the NCAA could get an easy win. And I do think the conferences would support it. I think, cause I don't know why they would push back on it. Don't you also have a longer halftime in college? Due to yes. the the nature of the halftime show yeah, with, the bands. with the band, both bands yep. playing, yeah, is it really? Um, is, oh yeah, it's significantly longer. Yeah. Like the NFL is a twelve minute tight. Oh, like, I didn't know it's in, twelve. Oh, it's twelve, and I think yeah. you know college. I don't know the official time if there even is one, but it's kind of looser. It's definitely at least twenty. Yeah, standard like, is twenty or twenty five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's ten minutes right there, and we've had so many like clock changes in the history of this sport. I mean we talk about going back to the nineties, they ran comparable number of plays per game in the nineties pretty often. Right. And then, then you had certain, certain rules in the early two thousands that really got like made it crazy tight. And then some of those, they, they backed off because they realized that they, they made it too tough. I, I wrote something on this back in the SB nation days. I'll see if I can find it, but like, it, it was not just, Hey, all of a sudden we're running lot, like a whole lot of plays in the game back in the nineties. And sometimes in the eighties, you would have teams running 70 plays a game. You didn't often have the 90, which is where some of the up-tempo craziness sort of exploitation of the current rules uh, comes in, I guess. But um, who knows? It's, it's going to be interesting. Shout what out to Keith Jackson. All right, yeah, he's He's still uh, – he, he always was the voice of college football and continues to be with the comments even 40 years in, into the future. So the – there's the one year delay. There is a, a meeting coming up two weeks from today. There, there are so many angles and so many power players that are fighting. The initial thought was that the national championship weekend was going to be the last chance to be able to get this thing in for the 2024 or the 2025 season. Of course, at the end of the 2025 season, the first contract runs out. Um, if there's a delay here, 
that we're not going to see any college football playoff expansion until 2026. What is your expectation? Hmm. I really don't know. I think the contract runs out. So you think Jim Phillips, does he hold all the cards here? Like, is he the one that's holding this up? Sankey likes four. And that's the the thing is like, he's, he's just like, Hey, listen, we're, I know that I'm in charge of this expansion proposal, but look, we've told you the whole time we're cool with four. This is but good. Isn't he us. also, but he's, I know he's fine with four cause they get in two, but isn't he also a pretty strong proponent of expansion? Yeah, he's but only leader. to a number that that allows him to keep having like a pl plurality of the teams. Yeah, right. Um, I talked to him, so I talked to Sankey on the field before the national championship game, and it was the day at, or the day of or the day after they had these meetings. And you could tell he was like, "This was a bad day." He's like, "This was a setback." He's like, "This was not." He's like, "We hit another roadblock." He's like, "It's frustrating," you know. So I I heard some of that frustration from him. Um. It, but isn't it funny how these these benchmarks keep getting put in place? Is like, well, if it doesn't get because it was the first week of December, and then it was like, well, we'll reconvene at the national championship game, and then it was like, oh, it's done. We're definitely not expanding, and then they have one more. It's like, well, maybe there's a sliver of hope. There's so much money at stake. I just wonder if they'll have the patience to sit around and wait for the entirety. I think this is delaying it, but I don't think we run out the full. What is it five more years till 2025, 20, 26? Is it four more years? How the long? 20, is it? You're about to have the 2022 season and the 2023 season. Based on my understanding, those two seasons will be a 14 playoff yep. based on the rotation of the bowls. Like it's like that, that will be 14. 2025, 2024, and 2025, those next two seasons could be a 12 team playoff, could be the beginning of a rotation of the 12 team playoff. But because of trying to keep give all the bowls the same amount of whatever, um, if it doesn't happen by a certain point in time for it to be both for 2024 and 2025, the expectation is that they would just start fresh with the 2026 season. So I think this comes down to a couple of things. Number one, can the ACC hold out long enough to get this thing to where there are more, more providers than just ESPN bidding on it? Right, because if you expand now, ESPN gets to keep it, right? Uh, so that that's a major aspect in this. I think that is where he has an alignment with George Klackoff, obviously, because you know the the guy's been in media and understands the value, like the NFL does, of having a whole lot of different rights holders. I mean, CBS makes a ton of money on the NFL and also spends a lot. So oh, ESPN, and and NBC, yeah, and listen, Amazon, YouTube.com yeah. slash Cover Three wants a piece of this. Okay, right. We yes, would we at do. least like to be invited to the table to bid on the college football playoff. I cannot disclose what our bid is going to be. You know, that's a violation of a lot of our own privacy. But we will bid. We would, we would like to make a bid for the college football playoff. Um, it also it, it begs a question here. The ACC obviously desperately needs money, and do you think the other conferences will say, "Hey, here's a little hush money"? No. in exchange for your vote. I think they could in a short term, right? Like a little, little short term payoff to get the ACC to shut up and 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 just vote yes on this thing. I mean, if if they're all making more money, what would the problem be with them flipping a little extra cash to the ACC in the deal in the short term? Now, I think it'd be a bad move for the ACC because it means they're not going to get Notre Dame, obviously, if they vote for the 12, but I think they could pay them off. That would be ridiculous. Just negotiations. <laughs> Well, I know. What do you think I it's know. more likely, though, that because the ACC clearly their TV contract is restrictive. I mean, it is a bad deal. I'm kind of blown away at how bad it is. Yeah, they're screwed long term. They're screwed long term. ESPN doesn't want to let it get to, you know, 26. Is there a way that ESPN comes to the ACC and says, hey, look, let's try to make everybody happy. Let's keep it in house, though. And maybe they rework their TV deal. Like that to me seems almost more likely than the hush money under the table. That if, you know, but then, because I think ESPN's incentive is we want to get this reworked before it goes to all those other bidders. Correct. And so, that, so like there might be incentive for ESPN to go to sure. the ACC and say, yeah, this isn't good. Like we get it. We want to try to help you out. You got to help us out. Let's get this all figured out together. We'll make you more equitable to what. I don't know how much how close they'll get. That's another negotiation that has to take place. But we'll make it closer and more fair, aligned with the Big Ten and the AC, uh, SEC. 
Like, I think that's a scenario that would be a best case scenario for Jim Phillips, I think, and the ACC. And I think it would be the best case scenario for ESPN, too. That's probably what the athletic directors are thinking in the back of their head. When Jim Phillips is able to say, we are unanimously opposed to approving expansion right now, those athletic directors are like, we are not going to enter into any long term deals beyond the one that we're already stuck with. Whatever new long term deal we agree with needs to change our financial reality in a major way. And you're right, Danny. It might not be hush money from other conferences. It might be fix it money from ESPN just to be able to get everyone on the same page. Interesting. Very interesting. So college football playoff expansion. Why is it such a big deal? Because when we have 12 teams, the the debates are going to change. We're still going to have the debates. Seeding is very important. The buys uh, as the as the playoff bracket is currently constructed is going to be something that teams will fight for. But there was a couple of places in the 2021 season where we could have had a Final Four that whew, it would have brought out. I mean, the, the internet would have been on fire. In a, it, stock price of internet would have been through the roof with everybody that would have been talking about this thing. Coming up on the other side, let's get through some what-if playoff scenarios from the 2021 season. Next. A reminder that uh, we will be tackling uh, a full mailbag episode coming up here on, by the end of the week. And, uh, and the best way for you to be able to submit a question to that mailbag is by leaving us a five-star review. And in that review, put your question. This question comes from the mailbag, but boy, we, we needed more than just uh, the normal mailbag amount of time to be able to dig into this. Uh, the question comes from Corey. Long-time listener, first-time correspondent. You guys are the best in the business and introduced this gem to at least three other people. Thank you, Corey. That actually is the off-season challenge. You have completed the off-season challenge. We want every listener and every subscriber to get at least one other person on the Cover 3 podcast. Uh, question. The talking heads of college football, present company included, spend an incredible amount of time prognosticating the various what the various if then scenarios for future matchup outcomes and their impact on the playoff during the season. I think these dark days of college football withdrawal offer an equally interesting opportunity to indulge in playoff fantasy porn, a retrospective playoff selection show. Here are a few alternate scenarios that I'd like to offer up for dis discussion. So we're going to start with uh, each of these scenarios and we're going to see what our final four would be and how things might have changed. Scenario number one. What if Ohio State does not lose to Oregon? All of the other results, including Michigan's win against Ohio State in the final game of the regular season uh, to clinch the Big Ten East, Michigan's win in the Big Ten championship game, and all the rest of Ohio State's results are exactly the same. Who makes the college football playoff in 2021 if Ohio State does not lose? CJ Stroud had them coming back. Remember? Like there was a little bit of life and a little bit of effort. And what's the, uh, it's like, like, I tell you what, if there were five quarters in that game, I, I feel like it's <laughs> Mac Brown might have said it. You know, it's like, I told our guys if there were five quarters in that game, we would have won it. You know, like there, there's something coachy in there. But if there were five quarters in Ohio State, Oregon, I don't know. Ohio State might have won that game. So if Ohio State beats Oregon, all the other uh, scenarios are the same. Who makes the final college football playoff? A reminder that Ohio State on selection day finished at number six in the final college football playoff rankings. In the very first uh, release, they were number five. That was, of course, after the loss. Four, four, all the way up to number two prior to the Michigan game. So with the Oregon loss, they were still at number two prior to that second loss to Michigan. So who makes the final four in that scenario where Ohio State beats Oregon? So just, just for these scenarios, I do want to point out, we are assuming everything else is exactly the same. Correct. Right. So all other results are, are the same. And I think this um, shows the fragility of some of college football, the fact yeah. that we can flip one result and have some major impact on the, uh, on the final playoff. Tom Fornelli far, would have been yeah. Tom Fornelli would have been the genius. He would have, his conspiracy theory of Cincinnati's not getting in, never getting in, no group of five would have been realized. We would have had Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, Georgia. Yeah, I I think Danny really nailed it there. We we were very close to having a bit of a disaster scenario 
in college football in 2021. There are actually actually several that hinged just on one result, and and the committee was quite fortunate uh, that you know Tom did not end up being correct, and and Danny uh, did not. We, we didn't end up having to test Danny's two loss Alabama theory, you know, which uh, hey maybe that's coming up. Uh, but Ohio State in that game had a 56 percent post game win probability, so it is not outlandish to think they could have won. I mean, Chip's point is well taken, and they could have really won this thing in regulation had they been a little bit better with their execution inside of Oregon's 30-yard line. Uh, definitely in the scenario, obviously, Bama, Michigan, and Georgia. And then Ohio State or Cincinnati, uh, they were only separated by two spots, as, as Chip noted. Um, it, so the Oregon win for Ohio State then would become a win over a 9-4 and four Oregon team, an Oregon team that would not have had that high early season rating to carry it throughout. It kind of had some, some helium throughout the year because it did have that head-to-head over Ohio State. However, I think because they won the Pac-12 North, even though that was not a great division this year, certainly with Washington and Stanford and those guys and, and the Washington State chaos, uh, I think that the 9-4 and four Oregon team is probably still ranked, right? Yes. I, I would guess that like well, they one they of the losses loss. would be the championship game. Yeah, and the the lost they were up to number three in the college football playoff rankings prior to the regular season loss to Utah. The regular season loss to Utah knocked them down to number eleven, and then after the conference championship game loss to Utah, they finished selection day at number fourteen. So right, so here's how I think this would go. Hey, this game was all snowy. It was a close game for most of it. Michigan blew it open late. Uh, Ohio State was undefeated until this point, and I do think Cincinnati gets bounced. In, in, in this scenario, and to have two rematches from the regular season as the final four, uh, you want to talk about devaluing the regular season, right? We, well, oh, oh, hey, don't expand to twelve. Four keep keeps the uh, keeps the the you know, prestige of the regular season alive. Guys, we we were. I had it seated differently. I had it seated: Alabama one, Michigan two, Georgia three, Ohio State four setting up an Alabama, Ohio State, and a Michigan, Georgia, which, I mean, you want to talk about the conspiracy theory. Not only is Cincinnati out, but you've got ratings bonanza with Alabama, Ohio State, and uh, Michigan, Georgia. Of course, a game that we did get the opportunity to see. I figured that Michigan with the Big Ten Championship uh, would get the nod ahead of Georgia, uh, who would just fall to number three, Ohio State, which did not play for a championship, but whose only loss was to number two team. I thought that they would get in at number four, Cincinnati at five and then Notre Dame at six with its only loss, of course, coming to Cincinnati. That one would have been incredible. Uh, so notes from Corey on that one. Is this the doomsday scenario of two SEC, two Big Ten teams? I believe that this is would be very bad for college football, but also unavoidable in this scenario. So Whew. yeah, would it but, be I, I I don't know if that would have been bad for college football. Like to have Cincinnati get left out over, you know, I don't know. I I get it. Like I would have been, trust me, I would have been pounding the table too. Like how can they get screwed over? But is that a bad final four? No, it's a great, it's it's extremely (laughs) entertaining. But when there was too much conversation around Cincinnati all season, started in August and we just carried it through the year. And for it to end like that, I mean, that would have made Mike Oresco's notes in his letter to college football. Way more poignant. Yes, yeah. 100 and which speaks to your point, um, Danny, about the timing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, scenario number two. Michigan loses a, parentheses, very losable game versus Nebraska. So all the other results are the same, including Michigan beating Ohio State. So in that scenario, if Michigan goes to beat Ohio State, but Ohio State has one loss, Ohio State still wins the Big Ten East. Because Michigan's lost to Michigan State. Right. And Michigan loses to Nebraska. Ohio State has gotten into the Big Ten championship game. How does that change the Final Four? Let me ask you a question there. Are we assuming that Ohio State wins out because of power ratings? Like Ohio State wins the Big Ten here? This is the only one where we do need to make an assumption of what happens next. Ohio State has lost to Oregon in this scenario. This is not the last one. So they've got the non-conference loss to Oregon, and they've got the loss to Michigan, but because that was their only conference loss, they're in the Big Ten title game. Are we giving them that win, I assume? 
Yeah, I think so. If that's what I did too in my analysis. Yeah. Yes, I, I gave them the win, but we were talking about a two loss conference champion and we have not yet seen a two loss conference champion in the college football playoff. The debate would be in my, the way that I broke this down, the debate would be the two loss conference champion uh, going up against Notre Dame more than likely, which is also not a conference champion. Yes, but would only have one loss to a Cincinnati team who in this scenario would be in the college football playoff. I believe. Denny, you want to take this one first? I think the two loss conference champ, Big Ten champ, would have been in, even with so even with the late loss to Michigan. Yeah, because Michigan was still a top tennis team, top five, top top seven. What were they? They were seven in the on they, second in the first release, and they were not even in the top four until November thirtieth. And I had figured that that would be uh, a little bit lower because they would also have this uh, hypothetical Nebraska loss. Nebraska was the Nebraska game was in Lincoln on October 9th. It was a 32 29 Michigan win. That is the game that we're flipping. So Michigan would have a lower ranking uh, going into the game against Ohio State, but we still give them that win against Ohio State. They do not go to the Big Ten championship game. Ohio State does because it doesn't have any other conference losses beyond that one, and Michigan has two. Ohio State, we're saying, beats Iowa. Does the two-loss Ohio State team become the first two-loss college football playoff team? Same score in that game, too? Yeah, same score. Yeah. That makes it a little – that brings it up a little more in doubt. Then I think maybe Notre Dame gets the edge. I forgot about the score and the domination that was there. Even though it was in – if it was close – and it was in Ann Arbor, maybe, but they got beat pretty bad. So I think that would kind of that would hurt them. So I would I would say Notre Dame would get in that scenario. So I I think actually I'm going to go with Ohio State here uh, because the conference championship. I, I now Notre Dame really did turn it on at times down the stretch, but if you look at the Irish's schedule, I I, oh. I think that the committee would have had a field day, or maybe they wouldn't, right? But I. If I'm looking at this, I would say, hey, they played a lot of names, but not a lot of actual good teams. I mean, th- th- think about this, like the names on, on Notre Dame's schedule, as I, I vamp and pull it up here from last year, who the Irish beat. So Florida State, not a good team, right? Purdue, okay. Uh, Wisconsin, I think actually a pretty good team. To me, that was that was their best win. They lost Cincinnati at home by 11. Uh, Virginia Tech, bad. USC pretty bad i mean 82nd in sp plus north carolina 59th navy 102nd like one of the worst navy teams we've seen i mean other than that covid team uh uva again like not a very good team and they didn't have brennan armstrong in that game if i recall right that was the one we all loaded up on on notre dame hypothetically uh and georgia tech again i mean spiraling losses mounting all the time uh stanford just a, a horrendous year for, I mean, Stanford 105th, Georgia Tech 96th. So their their strength of their their strength of schedule with a top 10 Oklahoma State team in there was 40th. If you pull Oklahoma State out because obviously they're not going to play Oklahoma State in the pre or in the regular season before the bowl games, you're looking at a a strength of schedule that is probably like in the 60s or 70s. And if you adjust for Armstrong being out, you rate UVA as like maybe a top 100 team and not like a top. 60 ish team. I, I think Notre Dame's schedule would have got probably skewered here a little bit. And uh, look, I mean, Danny, you proposed it yourself. We were c- somewhat close to having a two loss Bama team in the national title game. That's our or, next me, scenario. It, so, and the Notre Dame <laughs> like, is a key piece of this. So. But a two loss conference championship team from the second best conference in football, I, I don't think is that crazy. And Notre Dame knows the deal. They basically have to go undefeated because they don't play a conference title game, and they did not do so. Another significant detail of this, I think, is if we're going to give them uh, the the Buckeyes a win against Iowa, is the final positioning of Iowa, a team that slid a little bit in the midseason. But in, on heading into the conference championship game, Iowa was number 13 in the college football playoff selection committee rankings. So a, a respectable win for Ohio mm-hmm. State in a bounce-back scenario uh, against the Hawkeyes would potentially give them that edge. That would be an, I've got it penciled in as Alabama one, Georgia two, Cincinnati three, Ohio state four. And another little note here. I, 
I just, I would, I would not want it to happen, but I would laugh. Um, I would laugh pretty, pretty heartily to hear a selection committee member be like, and the conditions of that game, you know, the snow in Ann Arbor really limited what Ohio State was able to do. You know what I probably overlooked though? If they would have beaten Iowa in the Big Ten championship game in a similar fashion, like which I probably would have anticipated. Agree. That helps you forget a lot about that road loss the week before. It's just the nature of the recency bias, which comes into play. Okay, so Notre Dame is the key piece of this next scenario where every result in college football is the same except for one, and it's in the SEC championship game. Instead of Alabama defeating Georgia, it is Georgia defeating Alabama and handing the Crimson Tide their second loss of the season. Heading into the uh, conference championship game, Georgia was number one in the country. Alabama was number three. Michigan was number two. Cincinnati was number four. Heading into that conference championship game, uh, if Alabama takes its second loss of the season, does it still make the college football playoff? I'm going to say no. And I don't, I'm sure you guys probably noticed this. I started backing off that take as the longer, as the more we saw of Alabama. Like if it would, because I think, you know, it was pretty soon after getting beat, like they bounced back with the Mississippi State game where they blew out Mississippi State. Then they beat Tennessee. They beat LSU. And it was probably like right around the Mexico State where maybe I said that. But then, you know, not being super impressive over Arkansas. And the Auburn game, definitely after the Auburn game, felt like I backed off it like, man, I don't know if this is still viable. I still would have put it on the table. But I feel like, you know, maybe if it came down to a field goal, it was one of those really tight games, they would have overlooked it. But I don't know the way that they kind of came. Like I, I was envisioning a Bama dominance, you know, losing barely to Georgia, then they're in, and that scenario didn't exactly unfold. So I would say a two-loss Bama, the way they finished the regular season, overtime against, man, even as I say that, Bryce Young, best quarterback in football. Like you could hear him making the case. You could hear him making it. I could hear him now. I think they made the case before. Uh, it even started because you mentioned, all right, so the, the one loss comes, comes on October 9th, 41 to 38 at Texas A&M. Like you mentioned, 40 point win at Mississippi state, uh, the next week, the next week it's 52 to 24 against Tennessee. And then they struggle with LSU. Those are the three results between the loss to Texas A&M and the release of the very first college football playoff rankings. So with only that body of work, the selection committee got together and put them at number two. There were teams with zeros in the loss column all up and down uh, the college football playoff rankings, and they were behind Alabama, which was sitting there at number two. Even those late season struggles that you mentioned never never fell lower than number three. I think the favoritism that this selection committee showed towards Alabama from the start with that number two position, um, given the results that they had had so far, suggests to me that Alabama would be a two-loss non-conference champion and uh, and Notre Dame fans would be absolutely furious. Strength of schedule becomes the big argument and they end up getting left out where Alabama uh, ends up getting a, either the three or the four seed. Yeah, I, I think Bama's probably in here, actually. Mm. Um, under the same argument that I made earlier with Notre Dame's schedule being, being pretty poor, um, you lose to an A&M team that was respected quite a bit by the committee the committee also seemed to have an infatuation with arkansas which i don't really get uh and it also kind of respected auburn for quite a while uh so there i mean you, you lose you you beat florida on the road obviously florida didn't finish extremely well uh, but still a lot of these close wins that bama has are, are better than almost anything notre dame has uh, notre dame has wisconsin and that's that's kind of it so the committee is big on, hey, like we're more about quality wins than we are about about the loss column, which is not always true. It's just kind of something they say, but their actions don't seem to back it up a whole lot when you look at sort of the down ballot in the top 25. I think they try to power rate like the top five or six, and then they basically just uh, use the rest of the top 25, filling it out like in a tiered type way based on how many losses you have uh, in conjunction with what makes their ratings look better uh, at, at the very top. Obviously, you got to 
kind of show your work, even if you're working backwards. Uh, but I think I would probably go Bama here, even though they looked pretty shaky down the stretch. It is interesting. Both of these teams would have lost to a team that is already in the playoff, right? So UGA beat Bama and then Cincinnati beat Notre Dame. So you might get into a situation where you're comparing the quality of loss. Oh, right? no, not the quality loss. Don't you think so? I mean, Chip, they would say, look, we've already, we've already deemed Cincinnati in our little boardroom here. We've deemed Cincinnati a playoff quality team. Okay. We've deemed Georgia a playoff quality team, obviously. Cincinnati won by double digits in South Bend. Uh, Bama on a neutral site against Georgia, who we have number one with a bullet, is how much they lose by. Like I think that's probably the, the key crux of this question, as Danny noted. I think that uh, one of the biggest boosts to Alabama in this scenario is how much the committee loved Ole Miss and how dominant Alabama was in that game against the Rebels. Uh, Ole Miss was never lower than number 16, which was their starting point at the beginning of the college football playoff rankings. In the six releases from the committee, 16, 15, 12, 9, 8, 8. The Rebels finished the season well. The, the Rebels finished the season with an upward trajectory that win would be something that I think that Notre Dame would not have anything to compare to and really helped uh, Alabama because Texas A&M, these were the six results, 14, 11, 16, 15, 25, 25. As the Aggies uh, took, took a couple on the chin uh, coming down the stretch, that hurt their stock. But again, Ole Miss, uh, with it surging, I think the Rebels would be able to really um, be able to anchor the Crimson Tide. And what would, again, like – would that be the college football playoff disaster? Not just a two-loss team in the playoff, but a two-loss non-conference non champ yeah. keeping Notre because, Dame out. Yeah, because especially yeah. the SEC favoritism, the Alabama favoritism, like it would all have come to the forefront, and it would have been it would have been that would have been the most disastrous scenario, I think. As you were uh, as we were going through and running all these different scenarios, um, actually, let me see if Corey added any other notes to this. Yeah, I think that's the end of the question. Thank you, Corey. That was um, it's been a lot of fun. Were there any other games or results that uh, came up during the research that were you were starting to think like, huh? I want if this was different, then it, it would have presented a lot of headaches as well. Uh, Michigan I, losing to Iowa. I know yeah. forty-two to three made it like. So those, you know, it's very hard to even envision that scenario, but Iowa was uh, starting to surge at the end of the regular season. And if Mich we, we talked about it going into, is Michigan going to have a hangover after finally getting this massive win? You know, what's, what kind of Wolverines team are we going to see right there? Because then we have to start arguing Michigan against Ohio State with a head-to-head -head result there and uh, Notre Dame's uh, role in that as well. So I, I thought that that one would would create some interesting debates with probably the Big Ten, which at one point in the season looked like the best conference in all of college football, probably the Big Ten getting left out entirely. That's a good one, Trey. I wonder also like if Nebraska beats Michigan, um, how well does Nebraska play down the stretch? Does that become more of a quality loss for Michigan if Nebraska has some increased confidence and they're they're you know they're playing better down the stretch? Maybe they finish, I don't know seven and five or eight and four or something like that. If they I mean, but if they still, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't. What's, what's yeah, there's, there's the one glaringly obvious one is what if Oklahoma state, you know, punches it in, gets it in as opposed to coming up an inch short. Oh, we against should Baylor. About that right yeah. away. Yeah. Like that's, that's probably the most, uh, like, do you think that bounces Cincinnati automatically? Is there a chance Cincinnati? Cause I think you probably go Oklahoma state in that direction. I don't know what you do there. I really don't. Um, hmm. So that would be like a fourth legitimate, like brain buster scenario for the college football playoff. We have identified one, the Oklahoma state one we talked about a lot right after it happened. That one was very obvious. Corey introduced three more that were very interesting Four single game scenarios. In some cases, inches changing the result, often one possession or three points could have created just, absolute chaos in the 14 playoff model now does this exercise make you more in like 
more supportive of the 12 team model just because we would avoid some of these headaches and instead it would be a little bit more logistical like who gets screwed doesn't lose a chance at it playing for a national championship who gets screwed it might be more of a home away by no buy type scenario i mean in the words of Dabo sweeney there aren't 12 teams that are ready to go win a national championship we're just inviting teams to come and lose it, it is interesting to run these scenarios through a 12 team lens to see how they would have changed too. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we, we, maybe we could do this as a bonus show one day or something like that. Or maybe if I, I don't know what one, one day when like Chip and I are both are on paternity leave, we'll like, you know, D Danny's going to be fired up a solo stream yard and, and, and doing the whiteboard <laughs> and connecting all the dots and stuff. Um, to, to run through full 12 team models uh, doesn't, I don't think it works as well in the audio product. So our listeners I would agree. be a little bit. Uh, Do you agree with that statement though? The 12 teams, there's not 12 teams that could win. Correct. I think there's 12 I, teams that could pull off an upset. I don't know if yes. there's 12 teams that could win three games or, you know, to get to the national, you know, to win a national championship. And listen, I'm, I'm yeah. coming from this very much in the middle of, um, I've, I've fully switched the gear. Like I'm, doing college basketball stuff on CBS Sports HQ, on Sportsline, on Early Edge, on all of that. And there are not um, more than seven or eight teams that are going to win six straight games in the NCAA tournament. Like That's always the, the consideration when you're having to fill out your bracket. If you're taking national championship futures, it is there's a, so many teams that could pull off an upset or, or knock out one of those seven or eight teams. But the consistency that you need, not just to win six in a row, but have the last two be teams that are as good or better than you, almost guaranteed by the, the nature of the NCAA tournament, it's a very, very thin list. 68 teams in the whole tournament. Yeah, you've all got a shot at the national championship, but in order to accomplish what it takes to win the national championship, winning six straight games against other tournament teams, I think that list is a little bit more like seven or eight. If you are picking, if you're advocating for a 12-team playoff because you think it's going to, going to produce a different number of champions, I... I really think that's just completely false it will not it will the best teams will still win the 12 team is better because it makes the regular season more interesting because you actually still have a shot to make the dance fans will always lie to themselves about their ability like even as we as analysts know no chance right um you know the four four is just a really bad number for this sport we, we went to four not because it was the optimal number but because it was the best way to continue appeasing the bulls, right? Mm -hmm. Who had, at that point were still pumping a whole lot of money into the pockets of some of these decision makers. And increasingly we'll see if that can uh, go away or change a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if you were going to like design a playoff from scratch, you wouldn't choose four. You know, th there's a lot of things that are that way. We're like, Oh, don't change it. Why? Like, it's not like it's a sacred tradition. We've had this thing for what, seven years, eight years now. Uh, well, the plus Four, one was the, the original, like the patient zero is the plus one proposal and the plus one proposal keeps all the bowls happy because the right. it was literally, we are going to play all the bowl games exactly as they are constructed. And then after all the bowl games are played, we'll pick two, the two best, and then have them go play a national championship game. That was like okay. sort of the initial proposal for this thing. The only way we're getting true parity, you know, if people wanted to break up the monopoly that Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, you know, that the teams that are winning Georgia is to have a salary cap and a draft. Like that's just not happening. But I do think the 12 team, what it would do, I think it would fine tune the four. Cause I feel like there have been years where the fourth team in just like, eh, maybe, yeah, we got to put them in there cause the resume's there. But I think sometimes we've seen those teams exposed and clear. We've seen some of those blowouts. I think it'll fine tune the final four. I don't think that in the 12 team model, our final four will be seeds one, two, three, four often but I do think that we will have at least two of the top four in there. Yeah. I, Which, I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're the six or seven and you get hot, sure. Could get, could get really interesting. That becomes the new fun thing to, to, to try to figure out for those of us who make picks and talk about this thing is who's, who's playing the best, who's healthiest, who's got a chance to be able to go out. And like I was saying for the NCAA tournament example, win the games that you need to win to be able to uh, to go and claim a national championship. Fun stuff. I like it. Uh, if you want to submit a question like Corey did and and have it be a part of the, a regular mailbag episode, and, and if it's good enough, then heck, gets a whole daggum episode. Five-star review. Put the question in that review. Uh, we will tackle it in a future mailbag episode. You can follow 
him on Twitter at Bud Elliott three. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. See ya. See ya.